Welcome everyone and welcome today to today's educational topic, Conservative Treatment of Neurological Issues. Our presenter today is Dr. Deirdre Caramonte, who received her DVM from Tufts University School of Medicine, and she is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. She has been the staff internist and the director of the Tina Santa Flaherty Rehab and Fitness Unit, and Dr. Caramonte is certified in canine and equine rehabilitation and acupuncture. Current interests are in the fields of rehabilitation, obesity, and geriatrics. She is currently the president of the Veterinary Medical Association of New York City, and she is the director of <laughs> clinical education at the ACC Animal Health. We welcome Dr. Caramonte. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I was worried I was going to lose power because I was in the middle of like a thunderstorm, but now the sun is shining. So um, it's a beautiful day. I hope it is where you guys are. So we're going to talk about conservative management of intervertebral disc disease. Oh, my God. Oh. Uh -huh. Okay. Sorry. There we go. Um, intervertebral disc degeneration is an imminent effect of aging in dogs. There are two common types that we come across all the time. Classic type 1 disc disease is common in a small breed chondrodystrophic dog such as a Dachshund, French Bulldog, Pekingese, Beagle, Basset Hound, and Shih Tzu. Part of their intervertebral disc undergoes changes um, and that alters the disc biomechanics and relationship down the spine. Continued abnormal forces on the disc will cause the dorsal portion to weaken, and then there's an acute injury which is extruded into the vertebral canal, causing the sudden onset of painful neurologic dysfunction. These usually do not occur uh, before the animal is two years old. In type 2 disease, those are in the non-chondrodystrophic large breed dogs. And with this type of degeneration, there are fibrous changes to the disc and concurrent degeneration. This leads to a bulging of the central part with a gradual protrusion into the vertebral canal. So these signs are mostly observed in geriatric animals greater than seven years of age, because this is uh, the cause is con chronic compression of the spinal cord and the nerve roots. And just a separate note, I don't know how many of you see shepherds. I've been seeing um, actually a couple in the shelter that I work at. Um, of the non-chondrodystrophic dog breeds, <clears throat> the German shepherd is at the highest risk of developing intervertebral disc degeneration at the lumbosacral junction because they have a weird joint angle between some of those uh, verte vertebra. All right, let's see if I can do this without doing 20 times. There we go. <clears throat> so. Location, location, location. Um, one, when we are working with animals with intervertebral disc disease, we need to figure out um, where their lesion is. So safe to say in 75 to 85% of the cases, they are at the T, uh, thoracic to lumbar area. Uh, also, there are cervical cases in 15 to 25%. A lot of those cases are the bigger dogs, though. So. And we have to grade them so we know, A, what we're dealing with, and B, we know how to rehab them in the shelter. So grade zero, obviously, is a normal. Grade one, there is pain. Grade two, there's a muscle weakness with decreased proprioception. That's the ability to feel where their feet are, but they still can walk. Grade three, there's severe paresis, but they don't know where their feet are in relation to their body and not able to walk. Grade four, they're not able to walk or stand. Uh, bladder control may be an issue, but they still can feel deep pain in their feet. And grade five is the worst type of paralysis <clears throat> where there's urinary and fecal incontinence and no deep conscious pain perception. So one of the things we like to do when we get an um, intervertebral disc dog in is do gait examination if they're able to actually walk. One of the things is we are all, um, especially in shelters, worried about cleanliness and uh, disinfectants. Uh, so usually there's a smooth tile linoleum type floor. So one of the things is you have to get the dog actually on a non-slippery surface. Um, 
but if you don't have those, you can actually use a yoga mat or indoor outdoor carpeting. And then you just watch the animal, if they can ambulate around the room, they get used to the surroundings, you should watch the dog um, going straight and in circles to the left and the right. Now I'm going to talk about cutaneous trunk eye, just because this is a, uh, it's obviously very inexpensive to do, but this is a reflex and it is, oh, go back. Where's my back arrow? Here we go. Okay, here's Finnegan. And um, this actually is a, is the movie playing for you? It's not playing for me. No, there's no movement. You got that? Huh. I wonder why. Let's try to start that again. Okay, well, imagine if you will, uh, that the person um, behind the dog is eliciting a stimulus to the skin, which actually stimulates the superficial spinal nerves that innervate a particular region of the skin, and that will cause a skin twitch. Um, this test can actually be used to help localize a spinal cord lesion. So going up and down the dog's spine, if you pinch on the left and the right, um, where the response is absent, the lesion is usually one or two vertebra cranial to this level. So um, another bit of fascinating information is there was actually a study done about this specific muscle reflex as a predictor of recovery in dogs with acute thoracolumbar issues. And um, in the most simplistic terms, if you actually every day go up and down their spine and trace where their skin twitch is present and not present. If they, if, that, if they still continue to have twitches lower than where you're pinching, that's a very good sign for recovery. But if you have to start going up the spine and the dog is losing the skin twitch response, those dogs usually do not recover very well at all. All right, let's see if this one will play. Reception. Huh, that's interesting. Sorry, all the movies worked last time. Um, so this is a conscious proprioception, it's supposed to be a video, where the person in the back is actually just flipping over the foot. So the top part of the paw is resting on the ground. And it is up to the dog to realize that somebody has flipped over his foot and flips it back over. This should be repeated several times on each foot. And in dogs that have uh, long-standing spine issues, sometimes it takes a little bit of time for them to get that reflex going because it has to go from the foot all the way to the spine up to the brain. So I'm assuming, unfortunately, this one will work. Huh. All right. Well. Sorry my movies aren't working because they were just working and everybody's seen them before, but we'll just talk one more brief second about conscious proprioception testing. It is, um, these are normal, uh, if spinal reflexes are normal, when you pinch on the toe, whether or not the dog can feel it and is paralyzed completely, there will still be a reflex. So a reflex is not something that the dog has to think about. So if they still have deep pain, you have to clamp really hard on the toes, pinch them really hard, the leg usually jerks back, and then the dog actually has to recognize that this is happening. So they will usually cry out in pain or look to whomever is actually pinching their toes. If you clamp on the toe and the leg jerks back, but the dog does not react at all, that means it does not have deep pain perception. And that's where you would put these dogs into the worst grade five category for recovery. So we're going to skip this one because there's no movie there. So let's talk about what all this means with the grading. So in grades one or two, if we do conservative treatment, we have an 80 or 90% chance of getting them to recover. And that's really good because with surgery, you only get a little bit more. In grades three, it's about a 70% chance of recovery. 
and grades four about 50% and grade five with conservative and surgical treatment, they don't do very well. But there have been some success stories. It just depends on how long we persevere. Now, with conservative therapy, because that's usually what happens in cases where the owners can't afford treatment or in shelter situations that don't have a neurologist, what we know is that conservative treatment cases will recover more slowly, they take longer, and to a lesser level with an increased chance of recurrence. So when, that, when we have this chronic dachshund that has blown one or two discs, we know that rehabbing them conservatively, there might be an increased chance of recurrence. So we have to figure out a way to sort of prevent that. Surgical cases cost more, there's a risk of anesthesia, et cetera. And although they don't do that much better. So most shelters uh, have access to survey radiographs. Um, radiographs are good to show evidence of disc degeneration. Um, sometimes you can see herniation or calcified discs. And we'll just talk about calcification of discs because there's been a lot of work done on that. Um, calcification is very frequently observed in these chondrodystrophic dogs. They can be found at all spinal levels and can be seen as early as five months of age. Although the prevalence of disc calcification increases with age, it actually appears to reach a steady state or maximum um, before about three years of age. And sometimes these calcifications can actually also go away over time. Increased numbers of calcified discs in a spinal column, they are associated with the risk of developing intervertebral disc herniation, but at random spinal levels, not actually necessarily where the calcified disc is. So now when we're talking about conservative treatment, um, what we know is that there needs to be some cage confinement, which is handy because most shelters have cages, uh, pain management, um, and there's been a debate for a long period of time about non-steroidals versus steroids. Muscle relaxants, uh, rehabilitation, which actually is pretty much the cornerstone, and acupuncture. And I'm just gonna mention acupuncture briefly at the end because it is important. So the aim of conservative management is to avoid further deterioration of the patient due to the herniation of the additional disc material while actually allowing the patient time to recover from the spinal cord injury. Dogs should be cage confined in a crate for four weeks, taken out to urinate and defecate three to four times a day, and at that time, passive range of motion exercises performed. After two weeks, the amount of controlled exercise a dog can do when it's taken out can be slowly increased, but that's just literally walking a few steps on a leash, supported by a sling if needed, and walking only. Pain can be managed with non anti-inflammatories such as carprofen, which is inexpensive. Muscle relaxants, uh, Valium or Robaxin are helpful when there is pain that we can attribute to muscle spasm. So imagine these dogs who are sort of hoisting themselves around on their front limbs um, because their back ends are paralyzed, their shoulders are probably really sore and they're gonna to start to develop muscle spasms. Uh, so the age-old argument about steroid uh, versus non-steroidal in an acute incidence of um, intervertebral disc herniation um, is which one to pick. The difficulty with addressing this question is that it's really just too complex. How much of the corticosteroid, which one, which route, for what reason, uh, what length. Um, so the use of steroids can be simplified into two different rationales. The first is to treat the pain and inflammation associated with the disc herniation using the anti-inflammatory doses of PRED or DEX over a five to 10 day period of time. Uh, but unfortunately, there's no data to support the use of corticosteroids in this way. And actually, there have been a few retrospective studies suggested that corticosteroid use was associated with a worse outcome, but um, that trial was not uh, one of the best designed studies. Um, so we know that steroids can be used to reduce pain and inflammation, uh, but sometimes there's too much uh, 
reduction of pain and inflammation, they can be overactive. Um, so non-steroidals um, have both central and peripheral effects in their anti-inflammatory path. Uh, it makes them appropriate for minimizing peripheral sensitization of pain receptors um, and inhibition of cyclooxygenase within the spinal cord to give them analgesic properties. Um, let's see what else we have here. Opioids. Opioids play a very significant role um, in preventing the um, pathway, the pain pathway into the brain. And this is accomplished through their actions at multiple levels from peripheral nerves, spinal cords, up to the brain. Uh, let's see what else. Gabapentin is really good for uh, pain management and also a very good part of multimodal pain plan. Ketamine and other NMDA receptor antagonists such as amantadine, they play a role in analgesic therapy as well. There was a paper that showed that amantadine added to non-steroidals um, really helped uh, increase pain management in animals that were painful. All right, so if the dog has motor function, it should be able to urinate on its own. Um, people caring for the dogs in the kennel should be able to palpate, palpate and express the bladder. What we don't want is a bladder to remain full and over full. So you have those stretch receptors because then sometimes the bladders have a much harder time coming back into use. Um, if there's an improvement in two weeks, that's a good sign that um, we can continue with our conservative management. And sometimes we have no option but to continue with our conservative management, but we might wonder if that dog is actually going to recover. Um, as long as they continue to improve, then they can transition to normal activity, walking, maybe a little jogging, but no jumping and no playing. And over five, six, seven, eight weeks, they can continue on this pathway. Now, one of the things besides bladder care to talk about is um, turning these animals to prevent pressure sores and also these animals that are dragging their toes um, will have little uh, pressure sores on top of all of their digits, especially in the hind limbs. So we want to make sure that we look at all these areas and address wound care. Now, for every one day of disuse, so every day that the animal is paralyzed, um, leading, it leads to atrophy, and it takes three days of active rehabilitation to get it back. So you can imagine if the dog is down for one week, it's gonna take three times as long with rehab to get it back. So how are we going to get it back? Oh, this, this one works, three. okay. Not sure why, but that's good. So passive range of motion is one of the most important um, activities that we can do. And passive range of motion is a movement of a limb performed without a muscle contraction by the dog. The tech, the hander, handler, the kennel person is doing all of the motion. And this is really important to help joint contracture. And also these dogs that are paralyzed, the leg when it starts to atrophy, um, the limb actually starts shortening due to soft tissue shortening. The joint kind of compresses down. So it's really important to maintain mobility between soft tissue layers. It'll increase blood flow, lymph flow. It'll um, increase nutrient diffusion through all the joints. So it's important to maintain a range of motion that's within the patient's comfort level. Um, and it should be performed in a quiet environment with the patient relaxed because the last thing you want to do is have that animal be fighting if they actually have some feeling back there. And if you see the way that that tech actually held and sort of isolated one joint at a time, um, that's the best. Movement should um, start slowly and gentle pressure can be applied for 15 to 30 seconds. Um, and at the end of flexion and extension, sometimes you can just add a little stretch if we're trying to increase um, action of those joints. Now, because passive range of motion is performed without a muscle contraction, it's not actually a strengthening exercise. This is just sort of a whole health body um, feel better thing to do. Now, immediately following trauma, surgery, or overexertion of um, a patient, 
um, cryotherapy or ice packs are what we need to do. And it, uh, it controls pain and inflammation. Ice packs, cold packs, ice compression units, this dog is actually wearing, can be made. You can, made, you can make homemade ice packs by combining one part alcohol with two parts water in a double sealed plastic bag. Now, when cryotherapy is placed on the skin, it really only penetrates one or two centimeters of tissue. Uh, so its effects are more pronounced in the skin. But compression, which is what this dog is wearing, compression unit, um, can help drive that cold therapy deeper. Uh, so just um, using a frozen bag of peas and you can sort of vet wrap that sort of snugly against the back would help to drive that cryotherapy into uh, the spinal cord. It's recommended to treat the affected area for 15 to 20 minutes, three to four times daily. We do have to monitor the skin for signs of irritation and discomfort, especially in animals that can't feel very well. Now the opposite, or so cold therapy should be used in the first 72 hours, and the opposite would be heat therapy. And heat therapy can be used after the acute phase or after the first 72 hours. And um, heat therapy is used to decrease joint stiffness, relieve spasms, reduce swelling, and increase circulation. Now just like using compression on ice, moist and wetness actually helps to penetrate um, heat uh, which does it better than dry heat. Now heat should not be used if there's any swelling or edema in the joint limb in the first 72 hours uh, because sometimes that will actually exacerbate the situation. Laser therapy, um, oddly enough, I know that there's a, quite a few shelters, either they get donated um, laser machines, older technologies. But laser can be helpful in the early stages of treatment to help control pain and expedite healing through changes in cell membrane permeability, et cetera. Uh, laser also enhances endorphin release. And um, so the technician on the bottom is using laser therapy on the spine and in the top is actually addressing um, the injured wounded toes on the dog who is dragging them behind. All right, my favorite part of the talk, pulsed electric magnetic field therapy, um, is sometimes misleadingly called magnetic therapy, which it isn't. Pulsing electromagnetic fields, unfortunately, encompass um, a huge array of um, a big spectrum, making it almost impossible for people who are just coming into contact with PMF to understand. It's kind of like a generic term like radiation. So it's really important that we know exactly what PMF device we are using. And PMF is an active electromagnetic waveform that's delivered by antenna. And the different technologies are differentiated by parameters of waveform, such as antenna size, duration, and frequency of the application. So this is the battery pack. And then this is actually a hand, the antenna, the round black part. So this would actually target a small, smaller area, and this would target a larger area. Um, what's nice about uh, the CC loop technology is that uh, it is FDA approved on the human side and with that one must prove safety and that every time we send a signal out from this it is the same signal we do on day one or day 200. Um, we get the question asked about sort of radiation or magnetic therapy or whatever, like a cell phone, you know, can this cause cancer? And the signal strength of the ACC loop is actually one one thousandth the strength of a cell phone signal. Um, the beauty of what it does is this antenna can actually uh, send the signal through tissue, casts, bandages, vet wrap, you name it. Um, it, and it works to increase nitric oxide production in the body. And nitric oxide production is one of the body's own anti-inflammatory modulators. It can help increase blood flow, decrease edema, decrease pain. And in studies uh, shown, in studies done in humans and in veterinary patients, it has decreased the need for opioid use by about 50%. And while that's fabulous news, Regardless, just 
the issues that we are dealing with opioid use today um, is an issue. So we have come out with um, a treatment pad, which has these loops inside the pad. Um, there's Blake, he's wearing his own little loop. Uh, the Assisi Loop Lounge that has a smaller pad inside a sleepy pod carrier. And this loop aid, which you can actually attach the loop anywhere you want. So two research studies were done. Uh, I'll just go over them briefly, but this was um, a severe study done in the worst class of paralyzed dogs, grade five. And they got the Assisi loop treatment um, right before they actually went into surgery and then continued for weeks. And what's important to know is that by the second, by the first day post-op, um, the dogs um, had decreased incisional wound pain and they were able actually to flip their feet over better uh, by day 42. So that's one of the grading systems we have to figure out if our animal's recovering is that proprioceptive, conscious proprioceptive placing. Then they also looked at some blood biomarkers um, and found that it decreased uh, spinal cord injury mediators by uh, more than 50%. And this is another study done on the ACC loop um, at the Animal Medical Center in the medium category of grades two through four. And they also found um, that their wound pain scores were better. They found that the dogs actually did walk faster um, and their neurological scoring was better on neurological scoring tests such as conscious proprioception. But the home run of the study um, was mimicking the human data saying that these dogs that got the CC loop required half as much um, opioid pain relief. So just to reconnect that back, they felt, I guess, twice as good or half as painful, but they also were performing better in neurological placements. So they did better with less medication on board. Um, let's see if this will play. Okay. So um, this, uh, you don't have to buy a dog specific land treadmill. Um, and you can tell this uh, poor pug is pretty kyphotic. You can see where there's an old um, or fairly recent um, scar on the back. The dog is shaved. Um, but what's great about the land treadmill is by using that belt um, under their feet, they're getting a stimulus to move their feet each time, which is really important to sort of connect uh, pause up to the spinal cord, up to the brain, so the dog has to think about what it's doing. And there are so many old treadmills out there for sale, um, probably could even get one donated, which is really um, fabulous therapy for these guys. Now I just put this in there. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I know most seltzers don't have an underwater treadmill. Um, but sometimes even warm water bath, there are, uh, my cousin actually made a homemade uh, underwater treadmill for his dog. Um, I think it was like 30 yards long, but they were able to use it when their pug had an injury. Um, but it, the warm water helps increase range of motion. Um, it works to provide pain relief. And again, with the belt um, going underneath the dog's body, it's able to stimulate the dog to uh, continue walking. Now, if you also notice, I'm going to play that again, that the technician is actually manipulating the tail, trying to also have another sort of focal point, like, hey, pay attention back here, what's going on? And also, um, every once in a while, this dog will actually take some normal steps besides being dragged. And uh, what I always find encouraging is usually, like 99% of the time, paralyzed dogs will walk first in an underwater treadmill before they will walk on land. So once you've sort of reached that point of getting them to sort of get that sensory feedback going, um, we know that we're sort of hitting a, a home run. I'm just gonna mention acupuncture in case uh, there are vets that like to play around with acupuncture in shelters. Um, when you actually insert a needle into the skin, and rotate it, uh, collagen and elastic fibers will wind and tighten around the needle, which causes a mechanical coupling between the tissues and the needle. And it causes this like pulling on the nerve endings, and then they can interact with muscle spindles. Then there are a whole bunch of cellular cascades that lead to neuromodulation, which can continue after a needle is withdrawn. Um, 
Also, sometimes practitioners will inject B12 or Adequan into those points to sort of keep that um, stimulus there. Um, and a theory uh, uh, also about acupuncture is that it causes a transient overload of pain neurons. So it over bombards um, the spine, which prevents pain signals from actually being transmitted uh, up to the brain. And there have been several studies actually on um, electroacupuncture where that has been a big help in paralyzed dogs. So uh, massage, everybody's poo-pooed massage for a number of years, but it absolutely helps relieve muscle tension, edema, and pain. It encourages relaxation and mobility, improves circulation and lymphatic flow while removing waste. There have just been so many um, studies on massage, human and um, animal, which has really been fabulous. But I just love this cartoon because they picked the right breed. All right, moving on to really what we need to do to get these guys going. So modalities are really good for pain relief, but the thing that's gonna actually strengthen them are strengthening exercise. And those are called therapeutic exercises. So exercise should focus on balance, proprioception, awareness, and strengthening. And standing exercises can be um, started as soon um, as day one. Uh, what's really important is to give support you can use slings, towels, et cetera, um, but one of the best things is using these things called, called physio rolls. So um, this is actually a dog, right, and this is Buster, um, after having uh, surgery, um, but he's just balancing on this physio roll. And the technician is applying gentle pressure to the dorsal aspect of the pelvis, just to trying to get that dog to sort of engage its hind end and core. Um, then, uh, we can also prop the dog up because dogs and cats, any patient actually recovers better when they're in their proper postural stance. So these physio rules are sold for um, very inexpensive on Amazon. Um, and you don't need to go out and buy the specialized dog ones, but they are, um, we know where the plastic is coming from and they're more puncture proof. Um, so this is a very good uh, obviously inexpensive exercise, three-legged standing, and it's an example of an isometric exercise. So when we are strengthening these dogs, we don't want to use concussive um, activities to get them because that's probably not going to do us much good in the short term. Uh, isometric exercises are strength training where the joint angle and length don't really change compared to concentric or eccentric contractions, like if you're going to do bicep curls. Um, so isometrics are done in a static position and this is Finnegan, our model, and I am holding up his back leg and that's going to gently shift his weight to his other three limbs. So that's going to engage all of the other limbs and also engage his core, uh, which is going to be important for preventing hopefully more discs to blow in the future. <coughs> um, important to note that the person doing the exercise should not bear the weight of that fourth limb, um, but to get the animal to use all three other limbs. And then you can go around the dog picking up each limb to um, help every muscle. Then when the dog graduates from three limb standing, you can do paraleg standing. So these are opposite legs. Uh, this is also called a Snoopy. And it's excellent for um, then just carrying the weight on the two limbs. Um, but it's also really good for flexibility because you can tell that that takes a lot more balance. And for dogs that have neck issues or dogs that do a lot of neck work, um, sniffing, pointing, um, this is a really good exercise to strengthen the neck and the trunk. So after you do this with um, contralateral limbs, you can swap contralateral limbs. And then when the dog is even getting more and more balance and stability through its core, you can hold up two legs on one side go from there. All right, this is a dog planking. I don't know why my movies didn't play in the beginning, but anyway, this is a, um, a really good exercise for a hind limb dog. So you could have them step on these uh, rubber 
uh, balls. I think I bought them, I don't know, 10 years ago for 20 bucks. You can also use a Reebok stair stepper. You can have them put their front paws on your leg if you're sitting down, anything for them to step on. And while they are standing there, just watch the technician gently do some weight shifts so the dog actually has to focus on standing uh, on both limbs on the hind leg. And you can tell that there's some weakness there, but it's a very good non-concussive exercise. Uh, BOSU um, encourages the same principles as a physio role, but in a different manner. Um, the nub surface also helps provide sensory feedback to the brain, uh, but this is a really good exercise for balance and coordination. You can also um, just have them stand front limbs on the BOSU and use gentle pressure to the hips to sort of get them to um, uh, focus on weight shifts back there. Uneven surface walking, um, which is also, I think everybody has an old air mattress somewhere. I was surprised how long this actually lasted in our rehab unit. You can tell that dog is ataxic, but trying to walk, first of all, climb up there, walk across and dismount without falling over is really a good, good exercise to have them um, use their core and their limbs. And the dog is very happy because he's food motivated, et cetera. Sit. These are sit to stands um, and stand to sits and really good exercise just to encourage use of the hind limbs. It's better if you have somebody standing behind the dog to make sure that when the dog actually sits down, it sits square because we don't want to um, encourage um, bad posture when rising. Uh, but anyway, sit to stands are a really good exercise. Cavaletti rails, dirt cheap, you can use broom handles. Uh, these are little things bought at uh, Home Depot. People use ladders. Uh, you could have animals walk through tall grass, snow, water, um, but it just really encourages them to pick up their legs and focus on what they're doing. Um, this is why all the NFL players will go and run through a set of tires. Don't forget when the dog pees at the end, that's also fun. Um, and then, Lastly, um, assistive devices. These were usually thought of as sort of the last, uh, you know, he can't walk, let's throw him in a cart, etc. cetera. Um, but rehab has been actually moving more towards having these dogs actually um, get in these for actually rehab. So one, um, that dog looks and feels like a normal dog. He's focused on the tech. He's probably getting some food for him. Um, but the posture, you don't want these dogs laying like a sack of potatoes all day because that's not really encouraging anything. Uh, so there are plenty of um, cart makers today. Uh, it's great if a shelter could find uh, an adjustable one such as this to go high, low, wide, etc. cetera. Uh, there's also a bunch of um, orthotics and prosthetics, sometimes braces, um, sometimes devices to help um, so the toes don't drag but stay flipped over. But a lot of these devices should be used earlier in recovery and not sort of as a last ditch effort.